So we're very pleased to have um, Carl Gegenfortner with us today. Um, um, Professor Carl Gegenfortner uh, did his PhD in experimental psychology at NYU under the supervision of uh, George Sperling and John Krauskopf. Uh, he did a postdoc in Professor um, Anthony Movshon's lab at NYU. Uh, he was a professor for biological psychology at the Otto von uh, Goerich University at um, Magdeburg and is now a professor of psychology at the University of uh, Gießen. He has been awarded numerous prizes and awards. He was the president of the Vision Sciences Society he served as a, on the editorial board of various vision perception, neuroscience, and psychology related journals as Perception, Journal of Vision, Visual Neuroscience, Vision Research, and others. He published hundreds of papers, many in top leading journals, including Nature, Nature Neuroscience, Current Biology, PNIS, and others, and reviews in Trends in Neuroscience, Nature Neuroscience Reviews, and others. He's got hundreds, uh, thousands of citations. His research uh, focuses on understanding information processing in the visual system, looking into the relationship between low level sensory processes and high level visual perception and cognition. And although much of his research is on eye movement patterns today, we will hear about another line uh, of research in his lab that has to do with color vision. We're very pleased to have you in our seminar. So uh, welcome. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, thanks a lot, Sharon, for the nice introduction, which is a nice way to say that I've gotten older. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, not what I meant. <laughs> and I know. And thanks for the invitation. This is really my this is my first visit to Israel, and I'm sure it's not going to be the last. I'm very grateful to be able to to present some work here, and talk about the colors that you can see here to the left and the objects, the colors make up that you can see here to the right. I would like to start my talk with this question, why color, with a little bit of advertisement for color vision research. And why is color so cool? So first, some of the most eminent scientists, such as the ones shown here, have laid the groundwork. Young Helmholtz and Maxwell really established human trichromacy and with it, the basis for adequate color reproduction and the whole standardization process is by the International Lighting Commission, the CIE, that basically al allow us to view uh, colored images over the internet, for example. And the second point is, of course, that some of the most stunning perceptual phenomena involve color, such as the most wow. shown here which is modeled after a display that David Novik put forward a while ago. You might never have heard of Hans Munker. He was a German scientist who came up with the most beautiful color assimilation demos, just such as the ones similar to the ones shown here. But his mistake was to publish only the explanation of the demos and not to show the beautiful demos itself and to publish it in, in German language. Even though it, it was in vision research in 1967, you could still publish in different languages in, in vision research. And of course, all the faces are really the same. But if that's not enough to <laughs> convince you the color is really nice, it was just uh, remi be reminded of the color vision phenomena that stopped all work worldwide for a few years ago and was on, even on the headlines of the newspapers. And everybody was just asking whether that silly dress was blue or white. So, Color is really cool and interesting, so why is not everybody working on color? Well, if I meet colleagues at university, uh, at meetings, they, and if they don't work on color, they usually tell me that color is a pain and that it's way too complicated. And in this slide, I think this slide illustrates very nicely why it is complicated. The slide just shows six different color spaces and nobody really knows how many there are out there. And all these spaces are basically equivalent mathematically, but still the choice of color space is typically closely aligned with the research interest and the research question. And that's why even personally, I, in my work, I use so many different languages to describe color, but it, that of course makes it very difficult to figure out what people mean if you first have to sort of get used to their particular color space. Some people look at wavelengths, which is, highly confusing and it doesn't really account for human vision. 
but it does tell you what's out there in the world. The CIE 1931 XYZ color space is the basis for all technical uses, but it cannot be directly related to any perceptual processes. Cone contrast space is of course related to perception to the cone photoreceptors, but it packs the whole colorful world into a tiny region because the L and M cones are so highly correlated because their absorption spectra are so similar. So it's difficult sometimes to understand the stimuli in that space. Everybody's of course familiar with RGB, so that might be a solution, but it's really considered poisonous by color vision researchers. And two or three years ago, I wouldn't have come even close to it, but Jan Kundering, who was, who was a regular visitor here in Gießen, showed me that it's indeed the optimal space for some aspects, such as representing the space of reflectance, the reflectance spectra out there in the world, in some, in the, uh, it, it, to, to basically find, find, it's the maximum volume that you can have for the reflectance spectra of the world. So most popular spaces nowadays are based on color opponency, such as the DKL or CIE lab space here. And that's because we know so much about color opponent processing. And for, for many years, I thought that color opponent spaces were the only correct way to study cortical color phenomena. And ideally, all in this DKL space that corresponds to the retinal ganglion cell activity or maybe CIE lab space. But today and now I would like to argue differently in favor of a dimension that is really most relevant to the main purpose of color vision to object processing. And that, and that dimension is simply hue. Hue is really what we naturally refer to when communicating about color. And if you look at these objects here, you would basically you find it easy to label them by color, like the pink pig, the green apple, the yellow lemon, the blue uh, cream jar here. So it's in everyday life, we, we, hue is kind of synonymous with, with color. So this is of course not a reason why it should be important scientifically, but I will argue that hue is really scientifically important because it directly relates to the inherent chromatic properties of the objects. So in my talk, I will first provide evidence that color is mainly useful to recognize things quicker and to remember them better. And I, I will repeat that sentence many times in the, during the next hour. And if you want something to take away, that's it. Recognize things quicker and remember them better. But then I'll show you that the information about colored object is really out there in the world and that our brains have neurons using that information to extract chromatic edges. And of course, a requirement to assign objects, to, to assign colors to objects is of course that the color is stable under different illuminations, the property called color constancy. And I will present you with some new experiments that found close to perfect color constancy in a real world setting. And in the end, I'll spend a minute on what's next, the research that is going on in the lab as I speak, so to say. So I think this image illustrates my point quite well. Color really allows us to discriminate different objects fast and effortless. And here I've taken this image of some flowers and leaves in the background and decomposed it into a grayscale component and an isoluminant color component. So this image is the sum of these two images. Here, all the color is gone and I keep the grayscale and here, all pixels have the same luminance and only the color is kept. And what you can see here is that if you have to tell the different petals here apart and tell them apart from the leaves and from the background, color information is really extremely helpful and you can segment the image very quickly. Here in the grayscale, you see a lot of fine detail, but it's much harder to figure out what, what's seen really on the image. Now, rather than just showing you this demo and saying that's the way it is, I will actually show you some data that support this idea during the first part of my talk. The first experiment I 
ever did with color and natural images was actually together with Felix Wickman and Ted Sharp when I was at the Max Planck in Tübingen. And it was a very simple experiment, the simplest experiments you could possibly think of. And we presented observers with 48 images one by one successively. Then there was a little break. And then there was a test. The 48 images were shown with 48 new ones. And the observer just had to say, was it an old image? They've seen it before or a new image. And the images could be presented either in color or in black and white. And there were different image categories, but that doesn't really matter for now. And this graph shows the result. The exposure duration of the images in the presentation phase was also varied between 50 milliseconds and a second. And that's here on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the proportion of correctly recognized images, the hit rate. And what you can see here is that for 30 observers and average across all images, people of course get better when they see the image for longer duration. But there is this constant difference between five and 10% between the grayscale images and the color images. So that some people might say, well, five to 10%, that's really a tiny difference. Well, I think it's quite significant. And I mean, I think the difference becomes more, can be considered more important if you think about what else could you do with these grayscale images to improve recognition. So uh, a few years ago, Ben Bacchus, uh, I was talking to Ben Bacchus and he thought that, well, we could do the same experiment with stereo and then surely there will be also an improvement, similar improvement for stereo. We did the experiments and it just uh, didn't come up with these uh, kind of natural images. So stereo takes a little longer and the difference is not as obvious. You need to select uh, specific stimuli to see an advantage. So what's important, what we found interesting here, other than the difference was actually that the difference was already there for very brief presentation durations of like 50 milliseconds. So we wanted to explore that in more detail. The other thing that happened back then in Tübingen was that Ted Sharp was working on the Stockman and Sharp cone fundamentals. And uh, to do so, he had a, a population of dichromats, red green blind color observers. So he could measure the uh, cone fundamentals mo most precisely without any contamination of, of the L or the M cone. So we figured that we would do the same experiment with dichromatic observers and then see how they would fare and how much worse they would be in this experiment. And when we did the experiments, it was really a stunning surprise. The results came out exactly the same as for the color normal observers. And it's not just that there is this difference here again, but the absolute level of performance for the grayscale and for the color images was exactly the same. So this is really stunning, especially when you think that Many people say these people are colorblind, but you have to keep in mind, of course, that they're not colorblind, they're only red-green blind. That is, they lack one dimension of color space, the red-green one, just like most uh, larger mammals, like cats, dogs, and horses. But they, they still have the residual color information from the blue-yellow channel. And the way they probably see the world is illustrated here, if you miss the L or the M cones and 5% of the male human population do. The world might look to you like this. And these people have learned during the life to use that information in a, in a way that benefits, also benefits their memory capacity. And when you do the same experiments using these simulated images, then color normal observers fail to use that information because they, they're not used to it, they haven't learned to use that information. But aside from this point, I would like to get back now to these first 50 milliseconds that is really showing that color seems to be quite fast in extracting information from natural scenes. And of course, so we want to know what's going on in the first 50 milliseconds. And of course we cannot shorten presentation durations even more because then it will be a very frustrating experiment or at least in the memory experiment, we cannot shorten presentation durations, but we can in another paradigm, a simple match to sample task where we show same images now 
but much briefer between 8 milliseconds and 64 milliseconds. And the image is followed by a mask. And then two test images are shown. One is the target image, same as before, and one is a distractor from the same image category flowers here. And the colors of the mask are randomly chosen from the target and the distractor. So the color of the mask is not uh, diagnostic. And the spatial features of the mask are what way back then in 2000 seemed to approach sort of the natural image statistics quite well. So it's a, it's a very difficult task, but the information we can gain now is actually twofold. Not only can we explore these first uh, 50 milliseconds, but we can add an addition, additional conditions where we have the condition of where the presentation is in color and the test is in color, and the condition where the presentation is in black and white and the test is in black and white. But we also introduced the condition where we present the image in color and then test in black and white. And this is interesting for a reason because differences between these two conditions are more due to cognitive aspects. So if you see this image and you remember that there's something purple in this image, then later if the test is in color and you see something purple, then that's the image you saw before. But if the test is done in black and white, remembering that something purple doesn't really help you. The only way you can benefit here is really if you if color helps you to segment the image faster and actually to see what's on the image. So this would be the difference between these two conditions tells you uh, the differences in the encoding or in the more sensory factors. So the question is, will color be helpful? Most likely yes, because we saw that before. And will it be more a cognitive or more a sensory effect? And the results are shown here in the next slide. And the answer is really it's both. So at a very short presentation duration of 16 milliseconds here, people are better for the color image images. And it doesn't matter whether the testing is done in color or in black and white. They're always better. So they encode the image faster. And as an observer, if you do the task and if you look at these, then with the grayscale images, you often have the impression that you look at some kind of cloudy image, whereas with the color image, you you actually see some of it, like the flowers or something. That's at 60 milliseconds. When the images are presented for 64 milliseconds, there's still an advantage of color. But now it is only there when the testing is also done in, in color. So when the, for the presentation in color and testing in black and white, the performance is the same as for the fully black and white. So this difference is due to some cognitive or memory component or representation. And basically what this slide really shows is that color in natural scene helps us to see things quicker and to remember them better. Now the question is, the next question is really, why is color so useful? What is the information we use in these kind of tasks that support the benefits of color vision? And to find out, I will present you next with some hyperspectral measurements of colors of natural fruit and vegetable objects. So we just took some, a lot of fruits and vegetables into our lab, measured the wavelength composition with a hyperspectral camera that is for each pixel on the object. And what this graph here shows is the distribution of colored pixel on all of the objects. And it's interesting, it's, this is in a CIE lab space. You can think of this as a color circle. The origin is around here. And this is for all the objects here. And you might see here that basically the single objects form very narrow distributions here in this three-dimensional color space. It's, it's almost as if all the pixels fall on lines that emerge from the origin. And the narrowness of this distribution can be seen much better if I make a histogram of the hue, just of the angle in this uh, CIE lab space, and then plot this for a variety of objects like the carrot, onion, this is a potato, or the green pepper. And if you 
do that, you can see that they're really very narrow hue distributions that characterize these objects. So hue can really define an object out there in the world. And the question is, do we have perceptual and physiological mechanisms that can use this information? And together with Daniel Kuiper and Torsten Hansen, I've shown psychophysically that there are such narrowly tuned mechanisms, but we've also found similar narrow tuning for hue in electrophysiological -physio recordings. These were done a long time ago. When, I, when all three of us, Daniel Kuiper, Sue Fenstermaker, and I were in Tony Moffshen's lab, and we recorded from uh, extra stride area V2 of anesthetized macaque monkeys. And we presented these monkeys with grating stimuli that varied in the, all around the color circle, as indicated here. And the y-axis here shows the response rate. This is just the same data in a polar plot. And what we found was that the majority of neurons in V2 behaved similar to this cell here. So basically, once you have the preferred direction, color direction of the cell, in this case is yellow greenish hue, then the responses to all other color directions are simply given by projecting the stimulus onto the axis, preferred axis. And that, that's basically, also holds for retinal ganglion cells and for cells in the geniculate and for basically the large majority of cells in V1. There is some question whether there are also these narrowly tuned cells in V1, but in V2 about two thirds of the neurons behave this way. But we also found an, another third of neurons that really had a very narrowly tuned response to color as shown here, this neuron basically responds to this reddish tone and not to anything else. And the, the best fit of this linear model is just really bad. So if you take these neurons in V2 and later they've also been found in infratemporal cortex by Bevel Conway and colleagues, then and use them and apply them as filters to this image here, for example, then you can see that given this narrow hue tuning, you can segment this image very nicely into the different components. These are now just three different hues. All of the other hues will basically be shown as grayscale images. So hue can really define the objects in a given scene. And now based on this image, we could argue that color is tightly linked to objects and that it's mainly hue that creates this link. But again, I'd like to do better than just a demo by looking at tons of images and specifying whether chromatic information can really add to this segmentation process. And for that purpose, Thorsten Hansen and I looked at lots of chromatic edges in natural scenes. And these are example images from Fred Kingdom's McGill calibrated color image database. And we used it to see what the information is out there. And while you were probably scrutinizing these grayscale images, trying to figure out what they show, this is again much easier when you look at the color images here. I think that must have, this is quite noticeable. So, what did we do with these images, with these calibrated color images? Well, we used edge detectors. We, as, decompose the input image into a luminance image, a red-green image, and a blue-yellow image not shown here. And then basically we applied edge detectors to this grayscale image and to the isoluminant red and green image. And we, Thorsten Hansen, before he came to my lab, he did his PhD in computer science on edge detectors. So Basically, we used all possible edge detectors out there, and it doesn't matter which one you use. Basically, you find the luminance edges, and for each edge, you can quantify the edge strengths. And you do the same thing for the color edges, and then you can create histograms of these edges that are shown here. Here is the red-green edge strength, and here's the luminance edge strength. And the histogram has a large peak here in the center at the origin, meaning that most of the pixels in the image are not an edge, which is, of course, trivial. 
But when you look at the distribution of edges, you can see that it's not the case that basically all of these edges would be luminance edges, that all of the edges would fall sort of on a line here on the y-axis. Now the edges are basically, they combine luminance and color contrast in many different ways. And if we look at some specific edges, it's interesting, there are a few edges that are purely luminance, like edge number three or edge number four. And these edges are here in the image and you can see it's a simple shadow edge. That is, it, it cuts right across the object. So it's not probably not really useful for edge detection. There are a few edges that have no luminance contrast, like edge number one and edge number two. And you can see number one here between the red here and the green leaf. And it just coincidentally happens to be isoluminant. But it's a chromatic edge and it clearly segregates the two different objects here. And then there's of course a lot of edges combining this information. And this, we didn't find with just this image, basically that's what we found for this large data set of McGill color images that most edges in the real world combine color and luminance. And we found that edge strength is statistically independent for color and luminance. So if you know that there is a color edge, you cannot predict the magnitude of the luminance edge. And if you know the magnitude of the color edge, you cannot predict the magnitude of the luminance edge. And most of the edges really coincide. So there is a lot of information out there about chromatic edges. What this doesn't show is that we really use this information. That is, do we, are the color edges really of importance for our visual perception of the world or is it more the luminance edges? And to ask, to answer that question, we have, to, we need of course uh, images where people have labeled the, the important edges in the scene. And luckily there are such databases out there. There's a Berkeley 500 database, which where observers sort of had to label the several observers had to label the important edges in this scene. Examples are shown here. Some of the McGill, a subset of the McGill database now has these edge labels. And we did some experiments on animal recognition in natural scenes uh, a while ago, where we also labeled the, the animal in, in those scenes. So we can now analyze these human labeled edges such as the image shown here. And here we have the human marked edges. And now we again take the achromatic image, grayscale luminance image and the chromatic image. And then we extract again with the edge detectors, the luminance edges and the chromatic edges. And we use methods from signal detection theory that I'm not gonna go into right now, basically to determine how well the achromatic edges agree with the human marked edges and how well the chromatic edges agree with the human marked edges. And the results of this, sort of the difference in the area under the uh, signal detection theory curve, sort of the, the benefit of color or luminance here is shown here in a histogram over all the images. And you can see if you take a grayscale image and add color that basically the edge agreement gets better on average by 5%. So you take this image and you turn it into color, then you get a certain improvement. And there was only, there were only two images where we didn't get an improvement, where actually prediction performance was worse with the color than with the grayscale image. So we were very happy with this result. And we thought this is, this is wonderful. It agrees with the psychophysics, you get some benefit. But then one of the reviewers said, well, surely it's an advantage if you have a grayscale image and add color, but I'm absolutely sure that if you would take an isoluminal color images, image and add the grayscale information, that the benefit will be much bigger. So we thought, okay, well, in the end, we, we did it and we were really happy that we did this analysis because it showed if you start with the isoluminant image and add color, 
that basically you on average you don't have any benefit and i think it's uh, the if you look at these isoluminant image they, they, they appear quite strange because you miss sort of part of the edge, but the, it, they do characterize the objects quite, quite well. So there is, a, there is this uh, benefit of, ad, of having these chromatic edges. And the next question then is, do we have neurons in the brain that really can detect these chromatic edges? And I will now jump back in time again to 1996, the time when I was in Tony Moffin's lab, when we were investigating the question whether there would be neurons in the cortex that respond to color and orientation at the same time. Because back then, the dominant theory was that basically all the neurons that respond to color are not really sensitive to orientation. They don't code spatial structure. I was Livingston and Eubel, but they didn't really investigate the tuning to all the properties for each individual neuron. So again, these are recordings from secondary visual cortex in macaque monkeys. And we even assigned sort of the cytochrome oxidase compartments to this uh, each individual neuron. Sue Fenstermaker did the, all this histology. And for each neuron, we measured the orientation tuning and you see this neuron responds a lot to uh, this orientation, but not to the other. So it's highly orientation tuned. We also measured the color tuning using again, colors on the hue circle. And this neuron sort of responds very well to this particular color, not so much to the others. And it responds better to color than to black and white. And we computed indices that show basically the orientation index and the color index. And that what you can see here is that there are there isn't really a correlation between uh, color and orientation tuning. It's not the case that the neurons that do not respond to orientation show tremendous color tuning. It's more the opposite, but there certainly are cells selective for color and orientation. So these cells can be used by our visual system to extract these chromatic edges. And that was a, a long time ago, and we these recordings are very time intensive, but seven years later, Rüdiger von der Heide in his lab did similar recordings in not just in V2, but also in V1. And they recorded from several hundred neurons and basically also found that there's no correlation between orientation and color tuning. And there's basically many neurons that code orientation and color together. And just just a year ago, uh, Ed Callaway's lab published a paper in Science asking the same question. And they also basically, they, they now use two photon calcium imaging and they could record the activity of thousands of neurons at the same time. And what they found, it was again, no correlation between color tuning and orientation tuning. And there are many, many neurons that respond to color and are highly selective for orientation. Sort of these are neurons responding better to color than to luminance. These are neurons responding better to luminance. And the ones in here, that's basically the, the large population of neurons that respond to both color and luminance that uh, Bob Shapley and Mike Hawken were the first to point out that, that there is this large population of neurons that do respond to both. And back then in the old, days of Livington and Jubel, basically if the color properties were only studied in cells that did not respond to luminance. So you would, that would be a very selective sample. So, but basically these, these neurons tuned to color and luminance at the same time will be very useful to extract these chromatic edges and then with it, then uh, the objects in the scene. So it, it's these neurons exactly that can do this job of chromatic edge detection that we have previously identified in the natural world. Now we can assign colors to objects. We can use color to segment objects, but of course linking objects and colors becomes much more complicated when the illumination changes. And therefore color constancy is really a very important prerequisite. 
And that's why I'd like to address color constancy in the final part of this presentation. And I will show you, use this opportunity to show you some new approaches to color constancy. Now, color constancy, of course, basically allows you to assign the same color to objects irrespective of the illumination. Now, this is the scene I've showed you before, now illuminated by a reddish illuminant. And you would still, especially if you would be, immer would be in a room where the whole visual field is illuminated by the reddish, it's still called the orange orange, the banana yellow. And even if the illumination changes, basically the colors of the objects don't seem to change very much. They sort of remain relatively stable. Even though, of course, the, the light that reaches the eye can change quite dramatically. And that is illustrated here when I show you both of these uh, different illuminations at the same time. Here's the image under the reddish illumination and here under the greenish illumination. And this is not just rendered on the computer. The, we really produced this image in a, in a carefully controlled light box. And what you can see here is that the light reaching the eye here from the grapes, from the greenish grapes is actually has the same chromaticity as the light reaching the eye here under the greenish illuminant from the orange. So that there are these quite dramatic changes. And but we in our everyday life, we don't seem to have any problem with color constancy. I mean, we we do assign colors to objects, and that's not a big issue. But for people who have studied color constancy in the lab, they tended to find very low degrees of color constancy. And I've show show you here how these studies developed over the last 30, 40 years. And these data are from a beautiful review by David Foster that was published in Vision Research in 2011, where he actually listed all these studies and the degree of color constancy they found. And you can see here that the first studies by Arendt and Reeves, they basically it varied between 20 degree and 50, 20% and 50%. So this is actually, this is very poor. And if our color constancy would be so poor, we, this would lead to lots of erroneous color assignments to objects in real life. But when you look at this graph, and when I looked at this graph first, I thought, hmm, this is strange, really. Color constancy increases over the years, right? So in 85, we had like on average 40%, and now, well, in 2011, when David Foster published this, it was at 80%. So that's quite a dramatic change. And the reason for this change is that the methods actually got much better for and more natural to study constancy. Like here in Arendt and Reeves, there were always two illuminants present in the scene at the same time. So in this asymmetric matching. And then later, achromatic matching was introduced where observers had to adjust the color of an object that was part of the scene. It was uniformly illuminated until it appeared gray. And then even later, col simply color naming and categorization was used. And you, you, you do reach very high degrees of color constancy. But when I saw this graph, I thought, well, what's missing is really a study that shows that you can, you can be perfect or close to perfect when you use all the cues that are available in real life. And David Brainerd had already shown in 1999 in a PNS paper that the degree of color constancy really depended on the availability of different cues. So as you add different cues to a scene, the scene shown here, it was a real box with objects that an observer was looking through a pinhole that was with real illumination. What you can, color constancy improves and you get and you got here in this not entirely natural scene to 80%. And this is also similar to what we find for other constancies like size constancy. Holloway and Boring showed in 1941 that if you, if you take cues away for size constancy, you can basically abolish it completely up to down to 10 or 20%. So it's very similar here for color constancy. 
and, but we're still here at 80%. And I thought, well, maybe we can do an experiment to show that with, in the real world, we can get to even better than 80%. And so we did an experiment in the real world, in a real room with real objects. So we had actually four di five different rooms, four different illuminants and one neutral room. And the illumination was varied simply by putting colored filters on the windows. So it's really like very pinkish or reddish colored foil that we put in front of all the windows in the room. And that led to large changes in the, in the measured chromaticities of these objects. And I can see if you look at, for example, this sort of greenish sweater uh, that looks greenish under the neutral illumination, it really can change quite dramatically under the experimental illuminance into brownish or even blue. And the question is when the observer is in the room, would the color change too? Now, the, uh, even though I show you the objects here, basically what we did was we had 17 observers and they brought in objects they were highly familiar with. And as soon as they brought the objects to the lab, we took them away from them and locked them away in the closet. And they saw the objects only again when when they were finished with the experiment. And what we asked our observers instead when they were in this room with this colorful illumination was to pick the color of the object out of these 1,325 different Munsell chips. And they, for the experiment, the Munsell chips were not that systematically arranged. So, of course, it, whatever the observers choose, I mean, you would not expect them to get the right chip at random. But even if you know the Munsell catalog, those chips like in these, for example, in these three, three or four uh, bowls uh, are relatively similar. And so when I did the experiment trying to find the chip for my orange sweater, I, I, that was a lot, a lot of sweat. The, and, but the results of the experiment were quite stunning and they're shown here. Now, if people are perfectly color constant, they would pick exactly the same chip out of those 1,325 chips under each of the experimental illuminants. And this shows here that in about 50% of the cases, that's what they did. They found the, exactly the chip that they had selected under the neutral illuminant. And if you relax the criterion a little bit, if you just look at, at basically at the top seven neighboring Munsell chips, that, basic, that is basically the neighboring Munsell chip in every dimension, hue, chroma, and value. And you find that they're, that they're above 90% and for the bluish illuminant, even at 100%. And the, the probability of getting this result by chance is, is essentially zero. This shows, this shows you just, for example, the, the hue error and the chroma error. And basically one hue step here, that is the neighboring Munsell chip. If you, if you put two Munsell chips that are neighboring in Munsell space next to each other, they look quite similar, but you will be able to tell them apart. But once you add some memory component to it, it becomes extremely difficult. And the same thing here with chroma, which you can think of as saturation. And again, basically most of the settings, the errors here sort of fall within this one Munsell chip neighborhood, which is the top seven here. So it's of course clear that mathematically you cannot achieve color constancy for arbitrary stimuli and illuminants, but that doesn't seem relevant for everyday life. Constancy can really be perfect for natural objects and reflectances. For fulfilled illumination conditions, that's uh, I think the single most important factor. And for observe, it helps that observers are really immersed in the scene and part of the scene. And while those results are, are, are very beautiful, I would not want to do an experiment with real stimuli again. It's a lot of effort and very time consuming. And of course, there are lots of constraints. I mean, you cannot, you cannot get around physics in the, 
in the real world. So basically what we're doing now is of course virtual reality. The virtual reality techno te technology has advanced tremendously and now we can have photorealistic virtual reality and we created for example this sort of indoor scene we also have an outdoor scene and then we can easily change the illumination and for example the we have paradigms where the observer has to adjust the stimuli, stimulus here to be achromatic or to match a previously seen stimulus, or they have to pick, there are several of these lizards in the scene and they have to pick the one that looks gray. But then of course we can manipulate here so that the local surround stays the same. And this is basically what it, what it would be the adequate local surround under the, under the yellowish illumination. And the nice thing is that with, with these computer simulations, we can generate millions of these images and we can then feed them into deep neural networks as ground truths for achieving color constancy. And that's what, that's sort of close to being submitted. And that really shows that you can have deep neural networks that are very good at color constancy and that have a color representation similar to the human representations of color. And with that, I would like to thank my students, postdoc and colleagues who over many years taught me nearly basically all of what I know about color. And I hope that I could convey to you that color vision is an exciting field to be in and that now we can explore new things in ways that we couldn't imagine before. And with this, I leave you, I finish and I leave you with a little visual summary of my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carl. It was a beautiful talk. And yeah, I want to invite everybody to unmute themselves and uh, give a big applause. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, um, if it's okay um, that people uh, that the, uh, ask questions, then I'm um, open. Ah. Um, everybody can ask questions if they wish. Okay. Uh, I have a question for you, Carl. Beautiful talk. So I want to go back to the first part of your talk. If I will ask somebody to discriminate between single object, very fast presentation, for example, 20 milliseconds, like orange, black, or red color. According to your data, it will be impossible to discriminate between them, the color, which one is color, which one is black and white. Well, I don't see why that follows from my data. I mean, if you, I, I think what my data show is that we're actually using color information very quickly. No, go go to the one before that. Here? No, no, one more. At the very beginning, when you get to the 40% of uh, correct response here, okay? Yeah. Okay. It looks, both of them, so I cannot really get much information, but this is real large object. That's why I'm asking about single object that you have not mm -hmm. too many information, basically only one, one case. So here, if you look at the very brief presentation, it seems that both of them is kind of uh, not very good at the, discrimination or detect no no i mean the task here was a memory task so basically they saw for example these scenes for 50 milliseconds and then after a break five minutes later they were shown one image and they had to say whether they had seen it before so and these images okay. were not masked so even though it was 50 milliseconds the the observer the visual system had more time available to process the image mm -hmm. That's, that's why we use the masking paradigm in, in the other experiment. The okay. question, if you present images, if you present single object images very briefly and ask the observers whether the image was colored or black and white is an interesting one. And I'm not sure that anybody has done that, at least not that I, I know of. But of course, it's very tricky once you get down to the millisecond range of, of presentations. Okay, thank you.
very much. Because I tell you, we have some kind of impression that if we present letters like red letter E or black letter E, mm -hmm. for 30 millisecond, observer cannot tell whether it's black and white, it's black or in or color. Mm -hmm. So you present them on a black background or on a gray background? Uh, I think they are presented on white background, basically. Okay, or, okay. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it looks like that the color information is slower than the black and white information. Well, that's what people have said all the time, but at least, I mean, our, our data, I mean, these data here show that it's not much slower, right? I mean, it's, it's not clear whether there's any difference sort of here in this very first 16 milliseconds, but certainly not, uh, certainly here, the color information is used for segmenting the scene. Even though it might take a little bit longer to be added to the representation of color. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask about uh, most of the time you showed object on two dimensional screen. What about colors and uh, binocular disparity? Because figure from ground segregation when you have binocular disparity, you can do great job with that. So uh, did you look at it? Yes, that's, I mean, we didn't look at it, but that's, that's a very interesting point. And uh, well, ha stereo, basically when other people say that color is complicated, I say stereo is complicated. And I've kind of shied away from it for most of the time. But I, as I told you, I did these experiments with Ben Beckus where we wanted to do this also with stereo. And at least for these very short presentations, we didn't find, when, when we used, we had a stereo camera and took natural photographs of natural scenes and there wasn't really a, an effect of, of the stereo for that. You really need to come up with artificial stimuli to make stereo useful very, very quickly. But of course, if you talk about segmentation, then binocular disparity is would be really helpful. And it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. But I don't know the answer. One other question. Uh, you mentioned a lot how uh, with, with color, you, uh, you improve your discrimination of objects and everything. But in this case, every subject tested, it's a person that has been 40 years with his brain tuned to distinguish and to memorize these things. So what would happen if theoretically you have this, this subject that doesn't distinguish color, never learned to distinguish color from birth, he doesn't have cones. And suddenly you give him this memory test with color as a theoretical a, a experiment. So could they have different cues that would distinguish the same, the, the, the same distinct, with distinct distinctions we make with color? It, I think it's more of a philosophical question and you can think of all sorts of possible answers, but it's, I, of course we have learned to use color as, as a cue. And I think a, an interesting point is it's it's not exactly what what you asked for but i think it's interesting with these dichromatic observers who have learned to use the dichromatic color information and to get a benefit out of it whereas when when we are presented with these images we're not really better than for the grayscale images. Now, would there be an improvement if this colorblind that have been 30 years learning to distinguish the world with their own cues, and now you give them the other channel that they're missing, or this red, green light, now yeah. would they improve after 40 years of seeing the world some, somehow or some way? That is, that, that, that is a question that has actually uh, been the topic of a lot of discussion in, in recent research because it's 
you can actually with mice, you can do gene therapy and add a third photopigment to the retina. Mm -hmm. And the Knights have actually done similar things with dichromatic monkeys, but okay. it's not, well, at least the way I see it, it's not entirely clear that these monkeys would then use the, the information on the red green axis in the same way that a visual system would that has developed with it. Right, well, the brain is plastic. So if you don't have, if you never learned to see red and then suddenly you put yeah. that input, then your brain is not tuned to see that. Yeah, but I, I think with, with respect to uh, this red green blindness and, and cures for red green colored vision deficiencies, I think this slide should convince people that there isn't really much pressure on them. I mean, at least for this in the natural world. There are computer displays where it's because there's no shading information and nothing else where the, the displays can really be very difficult to see for uh, color deficient observers. But the nice thing now is that there's on the internet, there are simulations of uh, color blindness and you can just put your website or whatever you want to show to people through it and then you will see whether they will still be able to distinguish these colors. Thank you. Um, I also have a question about, um, well, it seems if color is used for image segmentation, then that would not be only for foveal vision, but rather across the image. So I assume that it would be more related to, let's say, lower spatial frequencies than the information available at the, available at the fovea. At the fovea. Um, but then, uh, but then color is usually uh, related to foveal vision. So, um, and also we know that most of the cones are um, present in the central uh, part of the retina. So I want to ask how, I mean, to reconcile this, whether it's really something that is some kind of a spatial integration or all over the image or rather more related to central parts of the uh, visual image. It's an interesting point. And the first, I would like to disagree with uh, your main assumption that color is really constrained to foveal vision. I think, of course, there's this uh, demos if you take like a color pencil and then you move it away from, from the fovea at some point, you still see a pencil, but you don't see the color. But that just means that the, the acuity is not as good for color as it is for for grayscale and also I mean the there are some technical constraints on the contrast you can achieve in the chromatic channels but uh, Torsten Hansen and I did some experiments where we actually systematically tested that in the sort of a viewing dome where we could present color stimuli very far out in the periphery up to 90 degrees and we found that if the stimuli are large enough then there's no problem in in detecting or identifying the color of these stimuli. Oh, wow. So I, th I think the, that color vision in the periphery is underestimated. But then the other point is, of course, that uh, at least when we look around in the real world, we do make eye movements to move our, our fovea around. Right? So that would certainly help. In these uh, experiments, I think the stimuli were typically constrained to less than 10 degrees, like in the recognition experiments. So that in, in that range, you still have certainly very good color vision. Mm -hmm. And do you think it is the case that um, although color is uh, mostly present um, in the center part of the um, image or sorry, in the visual process, let's say, then um, it, the processes are more related to uh, lower spatial frequencies rather than the higher ones? I mean, it's or not. I mean, do you think there is the same eccentricity effect or um, that we have uh, with respect to luminance? Uh, the, the different sensitivities are similar to those that um, 
we have with respect to luminance um, when um, the sensitivity uh, to high spatial frequencies degrades as eccentricity increases? Uh, or do you think, I mean, do you think it's a phase shift or a different modulation? No. I, th I think, uh, I mean, if you look at sensitivity to color towards the periphery, then the red green declines a little bit faster than luminance, whereas the blue yellow system declines slower. And that's just because it's more evenly distributed across the retina. But I, I think that color information at, at really high spatial frequencies is not very useful because it's prone to chromatic aberration. And so the high frequency chromatic edges are not that, that useful. So it will be more sort of the medium spa right. spatial frequencies or the low spatial frequency edges. We did this edge uh, detection experiments also. We wanted to see whether there would be an additional benefit for use looking only at low spatial frequencies, but that wasn't really the case. Thank you. Um, Very interesting. I want to ask a question. Um, are, are there people with poor color constancy? Is there a variability between people in terms of color constancy? Because I know some autistic children who have uh, seem to have poor color recognition or matching, and I suspect it has to do with poor color constancy, but I don't know. <laughs> That's a really interesting question, but it's not, of course, it's it's an empirical question. And in our experiment, we, we typically do find very large, well, not, I mean, if we get close to 100% color constancy, then there is not much variability, right? But in these experiment, in the earlier experiments, when conditions are not optimal and you will get an average of 50% color constancy, that's typically where there are large individual differences. And you get some people that are very poor at 20% and others might go up to 80%. But I think in, in, that, in those cases, there's also these differences between like in Aaron and Reeves, they found differences in instruction to ask observers to make appearance matches where there's paper matches. And, and then you can see things differently. It's usually because things are simulated there, you might see it in different ways. And depending on that, you get different degrees of color constancy. I think in, in the real world and, and in really immersive experiments, everybody sees things in pretty much in, in the same way. You still might get differences and people are not really careful in giving in doing the matching or giving the responses. With autistic children, that I mean there are these there are studies that have shown that they don't use prior information as much as other observers might. And there for so color constancy is acquired? It's something that develops through experience? I think it's, it, I would say, I would claim that it, it develops as color vision develops, as that you basically find it very early on. There are some, there, were, there are some developmental studies, but I don't know the details now of what age range people find color constancy. The problem is that color naming comes relatively late. So children can discriminate colors and see colors, but it takes them two or three years to, to give the proper names for some reason. Uh, is there an indirect way to get to, to measure this, not by naming? Um, by some eye movement or something to, to see if they, I don't know. But... Yeah. I think Marco Nardini did some studies. So. Okay, thanks. Um, there is I have a question. There... Sorry. I, I have a question. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, the masking experiment, the result was very interesting for me. Uh, so my question is that uh, it, it, uh, the, as, as far as I remember, the, the, the difference between the chroma and the chroma uh, starts around 30 millisecond, right? 25, 30 millisecond. 
So uh, my question is, uh, at which point, at which actually stage of the visual processing it, it happens? Like it's in uh, V1 or LZN or even Retina? Uh, do you have well, some I can, evidence? I can only, I can only yeah. speculate. I would, I would think that this is, this is V1 and this is infratemporal cortex and this is in between. But that's wild speculation. Why, why are you saying that? Well, because here, I mean, it's, it's more mainly due to segmentation processes and like chromatic edge detection. And that, that we do know that there is a neural substrate for that in, in V1 and V2. So this is, I would say that this is early visual cortex. It's, it's special information that is used here that is extracted from the color information. And here it's sort of the representation where colors are already part of the objects. Mm, I see, so thank you. At a later yeah. stage. Lovely. Um, there is um, another question in the chat um, about um, whether, um, what is the impact of developing cataracts on color constancy? Um, if you have any idea. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and then there... uh, I mean, it makes color vision in in general difficult, as it makes all of vision difficult, right? So I I would I would say that color vision would be affected in the same way. There's no I don't see any reason why it would be affected more than the other aspects of vision or why it would be affected less. Okay. Sorry. Can I just comment? Um, I had uh, cataracts removed from one eye a week ahead of the second eye and my whole color spectrum was completely uh, different. In fact, I complained a lot about the yeah, yes. terrible Kodak photography effect of removing the cataract and putting in the new lens. Yes. And Jack. actually after about a couple of weeks, I adapted back to the previous spectrum. Uh, I mean, it was all that the colors were nicer and more muted with my cataracts. The Jack Werner has done beautiful experiments of that sort. Where yes, he, yes. He studied the time course of adaptation after the operations and I mean basically in general color color vision will benefit from cataract operations just because you don't have this colored filter anymore yes but I quite to... liked the color filter it made <laughs> it made colors much more subtle in some way but we're able to maintain color constancy even with this warpage due to it being a slow process. So there's obviously some rebalance along the way. Um, there's some, some, some plasticity that remains even later on because the, the cataracts don't suddenly develop. It's something that happens gradually. And yeah. for all of us, um, I guess the, the crystalline lens is constantly changing. Um, and together with that, we're able to maintain color constancy. So I'm assuming there's a, there's a rebalancing act all the time between our spectrum or the way we process those colors um, as the crystalline lens um, degenerates. Is that, is that possible? We do seem to adapt to this sort of illumin constant illumination changes very well. There were some experiments where people had to wear even like red filters for, for days on end when I don't know who Steve Engel or someone who did that, and they found that after days, people really were able even to adapt to these filters. Um, thank you. There is an anecdote here in the chat that says, uh, re with respect to the age um, or the development of color constancy. So Joshua Solomon is writing at the age of two. My yeah. kid asked his grandparents why they got a new deck chair it wasn't new but he was looking at it under a sodium light so maybe that means that at this age it, it's still not there's still it's still developing 
but there are these uh, low pressure sodium lamps that are basically monochromatic mm -hmm. so then you really lose all the color information and then of course you cannot have constancy anymore mm, that's I when see. everything breaks down because it's monochromatic anyway okay yeah um and there's another question um in the perfect constancy uh, experiment with personal familiar objects is there any cue loss between real object and the monsol chips um well okay so i mean the of course the alternative way to do the experiment was would be to have like 1325 copies of the original object in different colors but I don't think that you lose much by using the Mansell chips. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, and uh, intriguing talk. And um, I'm inviting everybody again to give a big applause. Um, we were, um, uh, we're very, um, it was very nice um, having you. We're very happy that you, um, you agreed. And um, I hope that we'll be able to put the recording on YouTube. Next week, we will have um, Joseph Brooks. Uh, he will talk about figure ground segmentation processes in our seminar. And thank you again, Carl, for joining us. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Thank you.